and the Atlas. When choosing a class to play in an MMORPG, a lot goes into the decision. How useful will the class be? Is the playstyle of the class fun for you? Or maybe it's just a class you've always played and it's not much of a decision at all. But even if your main character's class might be predetermined, there's always those pesky alts to consider. In Pantheon Rise of the Fallen, the upcoming MMORPG by Visionary Realms, you'll have quite a few choices. In parts 1 through 3 of this video series, we delved into 9 of the 12 classes that are planned for launch. If you've been following this series, perhaps you've changed your mind about what class you'll play. A skill, theme, or a connection to the lore that really clicked with you. Or perhaps you've been waiting for part 4, in which we'll dig into the lore of the Paladin, Ranger, and Dire Lord. As a way of saying thanks to those of you who have made these lore videos so successful, and because I think I also heard a thousand loots being smashed in frustration, we'll also look at the lore of the Bard class. Although not confirmed for launch in Pantheon, this class has a ton of loyal troubadours, and it's been suggested strongly by Visionary Realms that there is a possibility it will be available at launch. As for you evil necromancers out there, sorry, you'll have to wait until sometime post-launch for your lore. But with that exception, Let's finalize our look at the lore of the classes. We begin with the Dire Lord. This non-traditional class embodies qualities of the warrior, paladin, and necromancer in one devastating package. As one could presume, the lore of such a class is found in the shadows rather than the documented history of Terminus. We learn the Dire Lord is considered a myth by most. When venturing to the civilized places of the world, it would make little sense to see training grounds or barracks dedicated to the development of dire lords. Therefore, it would be in the lawless, chaotic parts of the world where most dare not set foot that perhaps the dire lord finds its roots. A place such as Skargal, located on an isolated peninsula of rainfall and the home of the sadistic Scar. Scar are one of the four races that can become a dire lord, and their traits perfectly align with the nature of the class. Before we delve into why, we must first understand the dire lord more thoroughly. The nature of the dire lord is relayed in the lore, which notes, in the oral tradition of Terminus's history, there are legends that speak of dire lords capable of mastering the crippling power of fear, with some able to manipulate the very essence of their enemies. Fear is an essential weapon in the Dire Lord's arsenal, and we see that in skills such as Provoking Phantoms, which increases the Dire Lord's terror over time, as well as Deafening Whisper, a fear so powerful it negates the enemy's casting, and Nightmare Blood, a state of being that intensifies fear with damage inflicted. Now consider this lore as it relates to the Scar. It's said terror is a weapon of their warfare. This is a race whose greatest hour as a species was to rage like a plague of sentient, man-sized locusts ravaging and pillaging everything they laid their eyes upon. They see you and I as nothing more than prey and opportunity, and the more fear they can inspire, which starts with reputation and appearance, the more likely they are to emerge victorious. Scar wear body parts as trophies instead of medals. But fear alone is not the only common weapon of the Scar as a race and the Dire Lord as a class. Blood serves as much a purpose for sustaining life as it does in eviscerating it for this marriage of race and class. Note, the Dire Lord is able to wield their own blood in battle, using it to replenish themselves or to assail their enemies from the inside out. Skills including Canopy of Blood and Sanguine Shield. The lore also tells us Scar wear blood like body paint and filth like foundation. There is no consideration given to any outsider's opinion of their appearance. In fact, the worse another race thinks of the Scar, the better. If you can't imagine a Scar dire lord basking in maniacal ecstasy from the exsanguination of its own body to destroy a foe, you haven't been paying attention. For as much as the Scar suit the dire lord's character, there is a notable dire lord not of that race. The tale of Arakamel, the ogre dire lord, highlights the origins of fear and blood sacrifice needed to become such, when not inherently present as it is for the Scar. After witnessing his father being captured and on the verge of execution, the story notes, seeing this mighty ogre kneeling at the edge of death, the same dread that ripped through Arakamel that morning returned with compelling terror. He learned the aspects of terror in that moment and utilized them in the next. The tale continues. In this moment, he was overwhelmed by the dire, his body unable to yield until it was satisfied with vengeance. 
it could be said that his blood craved the blood of his enemies before he could regain control of his will. Over time, we're told that Arachamel gains mastery of his newfound ability, and in the process, Arachamel became less of an ogre and more of what is known as a dire lord. Self-sacrifice, albeit physical or spiritual, is the essence of the class. While the Scar appear to embrace this aspect, for others, it's a more turbulent process. It may not be assured that the Bard class will be available upon Pantheon's launch, but you may be surprised to know there is some lore which connects to the class already. Consider this quote by J.N. Gerhardt, lead writer for Visionary Realms, talking about the Bard class in the February 2017 newsletter under the heading, The Many Classes of Pantheon. He writes, while bards are traditionally known for their upbeat and jovial qualities in MMOs, we felt the Darkmer presented a unique and authentic chance to broaden the scope of this class. Songs and melodies in our own world are not merely relegated to the happy side of life. As Sethos, Corey Lefebvre, first put it in one of our discussions, what about the mournful power of a dirge? While several races can become bards, few have the singularly painful history that would allow them to flourish in this role. J.N. Gerhardt elaborates, stating, That idea was compelling, especially in the context of the Darkmer. A huge part of their culture was lamenting their history and remembering the excruciating moments after they came to Terminus. One can only imagine the tones of anger, sadness, and despair that must float in the air of Cyrenai's Rest, the home city of the Darkmer, during the day marking their arrival on Terminus, as Darkmere bards roam the streets. The lore notes, many say the cries of anguish loosed that day still linger in the murky waters. Yet, the fateful day of their arrival is marked by mourning, one week prior and one week after. Among the ceremony is a reading from the Day of Testimonies, a collection of witness accounts to the lamentable day. But it's not just song that makes a bard a bard. We learn that the bard is as much a performer as a songsmith. J.N. Gerhardt notes, the aspect of weaving together the theatrical with the memorial also fits with a second answer as to why Darkmer can be bards. The storytelling theater of song. We felt it was too narrow to exclude a troubadour aspect of the bard. So if you can't imagine a Darkmer being inherently joyful, can you imagine them pretending to be, or perhaps using that skill to their advantage? Can you imagine a wanderer from the sea who learns tales of other worlds and casts a spell or song over anyone who will listen? While the Darkmer are not the only race which might be considered evil of the nine races, keep in mind that, sadly, ogres just don't possess the fine motor skills to master the loot. And before you even think it, never has a scar chosen an aria as a means of expression over slaughter. Having said that, you may be surprised to also learn that the Bard is not the only class in Pantheon with musical ability. Observe the skill of another class, Venger Hymns, which includes the Hymn of Justice, Hymn of Devotion, and him of the stronghold. What class do these songs belong to, you ask? Let's continue. The Holy Knight, the Champion of Light. These are the images that come to mind when the word of the Paladin is spoken. In Terminus, only dwarves and humans can choose the path of the Paladin. An anomaly amongst all the other classes in Pantheon that this class should be limited to only two races. One might ask why that is. Perhaps the answer lies in the lore. So the question then becomes, what is the connection between dwarves and humans? On its face, there are a few common threads. Their arrival on Terminus is separated by 450 years. Their homes are separated by continental divide. And their history speaks to no notable interactions outside the summit of Vesu. Yet there is a commonality. Within Thronefast, the human capital, there are two structures. First, the form of Osirico, seen here, serves as the law courts for the city. In close proximity is the Anvil of Fades, as we see here. These were showcased in the 2017 developer stream, The Making of a City. In that stream, we learned the following. The lore component of this one here is in line with the human pantheon, and the particular patron deity of the building is Osirico. He's also known as the Blind Fatesmith. He hammers out the key events of all time. If the name The Blind Fatesmith sounds familiar, it should. Deep in the heart of Amberfate, the frozen underground lost kingdom of the dwarves, lies the Anvil. In 2016, Chris Joppa Perkins, creative director for the game, described the Anvil as a naturally occurring aspect of Amberfate. It was also noted to be the home of the forgotten dwarf by the name of Fatesmith Bastron. The title of Fatesmith appears to have some shared meaning between the two previously disconnected races. What meaning might that be though? What if the paladin represents the core values of both the dwarven and human pantheon of deities? Judgment, fate, and justice. 
recall the triumvirate of the three in the Dwarven pantheon known as Locke, En, and Hammer, neutral gods present during the creation of the dwarves, the arbiters of justice and balance. The humans named their highest court after Osirico. As noted earlier, they sing the hymn of justice. The class page tells us, as a paladin, you have left those halls in pursuit of justice, but carry these songs and your celestial power with you into battle. Our traditional perceptions of a paladin may just be too restrictive. Consider the following from the paladin class description. Once a cleric themselves, the paladin has felt the call that transcends the rigid customs of the cleric order. Led by their convictions, the paladins set off on their own to carry out the righteous judgment as they see fit. So knowing all paladins are former clerics, who would they seek to bring justice to? We learn, perhaps most iconically, the paladin is driven by an unquenchable hatred of undeath, a flame they have stoked into a ceaseless pursuit. Thus, a paladin is never more fierce than when they stand face to face with undeath. Amongst the humans, one figure stands out in this regard. Avendir, the famed leader who helped them achieve victory in the Deicide War, just may be a paladin of legend. From the human story on Terminus, it is noted, Avendir gained a broad reputation for battlefront leadership and also for his gift of stirring oration. His famed speech of souls is still repeated amongst the humans and elves, credited with reviving the hearts of the surviving dead, a reference to the broken-hearted victors of the war. Admittedly, a somewhat literal interpretation of undead, but these tales are not always to be taken on their face. We end our journey with the ranger the hunter in the shadows, searching for threats, or perhaps for the clues of those threats unseen by most. Wise in the ways of the natural world, with a talent for showing others the path, rangers in Pantheon adhere to the traditions of the class, yet offer something novel as well. Let's examine both aspects. First, the traditional. From the class lore we learn, the wilds of Terminus call to rangers, drawing them deeper into its mysteries. It is in these untamed regions of the world that rangers are forged into versatile and ferocious warriors united with the land and animals they commune with. We look to the world of Terminus for its most primal areas to find the trials of the ranger training. Places like Wild's End, a place the lore describes thusly. This mist-laden land endures as an untamed soul. Or to the Soul of Ages, a corner of Fairthale Rarely explored by outsiders, the cave system known as the soul remains something of an elven preserve. And even the Forlan, a rugged area which lies just outside the gates of Thronefast. Not surprisingly, it is these lands the race is capable of becoming a ranger, namely the halflings, elves, and humans call home. In these environments, rangers find their greatest utility. The fauna that roam here offer the ranger a chance to utilize skills such as Kalen's command, a key ability when nature attempts to overwhelm the hunter. We know the elven woods are filled with creatures of the red grove known as wander beasts. Additionally, Ladwin's whisper might allow the ranger to delve deeper through the narrow passages of the soul of Aegis, avoiding the aggression of the threats that dwell within this hollow. Perhaps Kalen and Ladwin were rangers of great renown, able to control the will of animals as no other could. Now for the novel. Consider the tale of the Twin Head God, a piece of lore released in November of 2018 which describes the deity as follows. It is said he was ever a hunter, but in those days his prey was solace. The realm of the Twin Head God was a wilderness of spirit and soul where the humble thrived but the proud could not endure. Here he would commune with the mortals who found the door to his wilderness teaching them the hidden paths of wisdom that exist in their world, and also how to survive in his. As an archetype for the ranger class in Pantheon, this lore reflects a class with an external ferocity balanced by an internal tranquility. The ranger's tracking ability being a manifestation of the twin head god's desire to reveal forgotten pathways. This connection is anchored deeply in Terminus's ancient history. The tale predates the arrival of all races, and in fact the known gods. It is noted, in these early ages, the twin head god was a passive observer of mortal kind, watching the peoples of this planet strive for survival and knowledge, power and peace. To be a ranger is to be an extension of an ancient god. And while this may seem grandiose in its telling, lest we forget that gods, often as rangers, have walked among us. Making this series of videos has been challenging. But finding the pieces of lore that connect in some way required me to really think about the lore of Pantheon in new ways. But that's also what made it so enjoyable. I feel like I've gained some insights, and I hope you have as well. 
Again, without the inspiring work of Visionary Realms, these aren't possible. So check the link in the description and consider pledging to see Pantheon's lore come to life. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.